helpful, but um, the advantage of learning something about um, um, the um, process of doing order thresholds, uh, how they operate, and so forth. Uh, Tom is in uh, 1009 Wixon, and also over in the Knowledge Building 108 or something like that, where the odor threshold equipment is. Um, he needs about 20 uh, volunteers for the um, uh, his odor panel. He'd like to get um, uh, young and old and both sexes, so there's a chance for everybody on this one here now. So you don't have to be bashful for any reason. You're not too young to do it, and you're not too old to do it. It's perfectly all right to volunteer. Second, uh, I realize that um, the uh, pressure on the Wixon, um, the Winkler Library has been very great. But I have made a little survey of the Reserve Book Room and the Cruce Library, and there's been no pressures there. Nobody goes over there. I can understand why. It's much easier to walk into the Winkler Library to look at the books than it is to go to RBR or as it is to go over to the Cruz. Now, I, sometimes they have been used, but they have not, in general, been at all busy. Whereas the pressure on, uh, on um, Gail and the people in, um, in the Winkler Library has been very great. So I'd appreciate it if you would use the other libraries where we have these books on reserve. Third, just a moment, I'll come back to it. Third, there are a few reprint things that I've indicated. You can always get those in the journal itself, which is on the shelf, and both in Enology and in the main library. Uh, we simply run out of reprints in many cases, and nowadays the Department of Finance frowns upon getting reprints as long as Xerox machines operate. So we have not been putting very many reprints out. Uh, all right, now your question. APR is not on reserve in the main library. <laughs> it will be then, anyway, by, the, by 3 o'clock this afternoon. You can be sure of that. It'll be on reserve continuously till June, as a matter of fact, because we use that for another course in the spring. Break. Now, the third, uh, fourth problem has to do with um, um, calculators. Um, we would not be teaching a, a course in sensory evaluation unless we ask you to make some measures of central tendency or some measures of the significance of your results. Uh, we're doing subjective uh, work when we do sensory evaluation, and that means that we all differ from each other. And uh, since we all differ from each other and there are differences in our experiments, we have to find out if the differences are due to us or the differences are in the experiment. And the only way we can do that is to apply some sort of statistical analysis. Now, I've tried desperately to keep these uh, on the easy side. Uh, and most of you have taken it that way. Uh, if you, uh, be, some of you, however, are, are unfamiliar with statistical analysis. And it's obviously been hard for you. Well, I can tell you that from five on, there will not be any statistical analysis. But perhaps an important part of the course is the first uh, four laboratories. So you'll have to bear with it. As to calculators, the one over in the um, tasting room in the Enology building has been used practically not at all. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, if anybody cannot do it by hand, uh, if they will go up to the fifth floor of AOB3, that's the one right next to Wixon, between Wellman and Nixon, and uh, see uh, Mrs. Rao in the main office of the math department. They have nine calculators there, and if they're not being used by a class, they have several classes that meet in that room, uh, they'll be glad to give you a key, and you can go down and do your calculation and then turn the key back in. And you can tell them that I sent you over there, and they'll be glad to cooperate. The one, uh, Professor Berg asked us not to use the one in his office, so the one in the Enology building is the only available one that I know of at the moment. All right, then so much for the general knowledge. Any other things of general interest? This is a, a, looks like a long lecture, and it is a long lecture. I'll never get through it. Uh, but you can, I went to the trouble of writing it out in considerably more detail than last year for the reason that, first of all, we never will get through with it. 
And second, you need a lot of this data. I don't expect you to remember it, but you may need it for reference purposes sometime later on. The general theory of this lecture is that if we could find out what causes some specific odors in wines, uh, we could then uh, measure that amount, and if we knew the threshold, we could predict whether or not it was having an effect on the odor or not. Uh, and some of these are good, and some of them are bad. In the long, long distant future, we would hope to be able to uh, make correlations between the amounts of these different compounds, pro and con, that are present in wine, and do what we call predicting equations. Predict from the chemical analysis <coughs> what the sensory evaluation might be. Now that's not what we're talking about in this particular one. We're simply saying that these are thresholds for various compounds, they are, uh, and they are important and uh, that if they're below the thresholds, you don't need to worry about them in general. And if they're above the thresholds, and you can measure them, you can get some idea of whether or not they are uh, uh, any importance in the sensory evaluation. And the very first one, and the, most, the easiest one to remember, is methyl and ethyl anthranolate. We've known about both of them and their contribution to Vitus Labrusca since 1921. The man named Anderson at Cornell worked on them. They amount to about a half a milligram to five milligrams per liter. They go up during the ripening season. There is a table on that in one of the textbooks, or several of them, I guess. And uh, they are, um, uh, they give it that, what I call the Welch's grape juice smell, or what some people call the foxy smell, uh, at uh, amounts below about five tenths. So they do not give any threshold. <coughs> They are practically completely absent from all viniferas, never been found in rotundifolias. So they are a good measure of whether there's been any Concord flavor mixed in or not, the presence of these. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you might be producing Concord wine and want to keep it at some standard, at one milligram per liter or two milligrams per liter or whatever it might be. There's quite a bit of them present in Catawba also and uh, lesser amount in Delaware, fairly common in all of the eastern grapes. Now there's an error in the Hilgardia, beta-phenethanol, says is a revealing compound or an important compound in vitus rotundifolia. But since that time with uh, GLC, uh, we found that uh, beta-phenethanol is present in a wide variety of grape varieties and of many other uh, species of horticultural plants, so that it is not uh, just in vitus rotundifolia. The amounts that we've found are between 10 and 75 uh, milligrams per liter. We don't have any good threshold at the moment for them. I don't know whether Mr. Um, Selfridge is going to run that threshold or not. There are some of its esters also present which have quite distinct smells. The smell you've already been familiar with in the laboratory, it's the rose-like smell to some of you, it's the violet-like smell to some other people, and semantically there are several ways of describing beta-phenethanol. It's been reported to be one of the revealing compounds in French Bourgeolais but we've never done any studies on how much is present in French Bourgeolais. And as I will emphasize a little later, so many of the French Bourgeolais are not Bourgeolais at all. Uh, I don't think that just going out in the market and making samples would have any meaning because perhaps as many as half of them would not show uh, any beta-phenethanol if it is in fact a revealing compound. Now the next problem has to do with the spoilage product, ethyl acetate versus acetic acid. You'll be doing a threshold on this and some experiments on this in the next uh, um, laboratory. In the work that was done here with Mr. Filippello and Mrs. Pangborn and Professor Webb and Professor Berg some years ago, the threshold in water was shown to be as little as 8 to 11 milligrams. That's a very low threshold. But the difference thresholds in wines were very high. Uh, in a wine that had 212 uh, milligrams per liter of uh, of ethyl acetate, the threshold was 175. That is, you had to move it above or below 212, 175 milligrams to get a difference. That's a very big threshold. So here we have an anomalous situation of a very low threshold in water and exceedingly high thresholds uh, in, um, uh, in wines. Uh, I've said that this ex particular experiment needs repeating. It would be a very good experiment to do. It would not be a difficult experiment. And uh, I'm sure that these differences are too large. One of the reasons I'm sure they're too large is that it's been suggested in the European literature that the limit for ethyl acetate be set at about 180 to 200 milligrams per liter. 
Now the reason for this is that you'll find out in the laboratory of next Friday and Monday that ethyl acetate has a much more of a spoil character than acetic acid. The present limits on acetic acid, the present chemical limits on acetic acid uh, in this country uh, for California are 120 for red table wine. These are grams, or milligrams, so grams per 100 milliliters. Okay? And 110 for white and dessert. Or the federal limits for the same thing is 140 and 120. Now, if you take pure acetic acid, which you'll be doing this experiment, and you put it in a wine with no volatile acidity, with no acetic acid, at these amounts it does not smell very spoiled. Whereas if you put ethyl acetate in at amounts of around 150 to 200, it does smell vinegary and spoiled. So it looks like, and I believe it is a fact now that we recognize, that ethyl acetate, when it gets up that high, begins to have a vinegary smell, and that that vinegary smell contributes more to... Um, the spoil character than does acetic acid. And that's the reason for the suggestion to move from acetic acid as the threshold over to ethyl acetate as the threshold. Does anybody know why we haven't moved yet? Since it seems logical and clear and everything like that. Well, one of the reasons is that the method for determining acetic acid is quite simple. And you can recover 99% of the acetic acid. All of the methods so far described in the literature for determination of uh, ethyl acetate are uh, subject to errors of other ethyl esters and also the question of getting a, a good determination simply uh, hasn't been worked out. If somebody would work out that method, I'm sure the government would be glad to adopt it because the present method is a little cumbersome. You have to distill the acetic acid off, uh, steam distill it. It takes some time to do that and if we could get an ethyl acetate, specific ethyl acetate method that could be done faster, it would soon be adopted, I'm sure. Uh, Professor Ressler and I did a little work on this last year. We were trying to find out how pleasant and unpleasant various combinations of things were concerned, and we verified that ethyl acetate at rather low concentrations was less present, unpleasant, than acetic acid. Uh, this was with an untrained panel, but it seems to be quite clear. Um, the, ne uh, the it probably doesn't make any difference in the long run whether or not you use acetic acid or ethyl acetate. Uh, you have the following situations that might occur. One, you might be producing ethyl acetate and no acetic acid. That occurred in 1936 in California. We had some bacteria growing, Professor Vaughn feels there were bacteria growing in association with yeast that produced large amounts of ethyl acetate and very low amounts of acetic acid. We've also had a situation where you can produce acetic acid and very little, but little or no, little or no ethyl acetate. I think chemically it's not possible to produce nothing, but it's little will take care of that. And then you can have a situation where the, the ethyl acetate uh, essentially equals the uh, acetic acid. Now, in the first situation, you would have spoiled wines, but chemically they wouldn't show up. And that would be bad from the public point of view, because you could put out wines that had a high ethyl acetate content and low acetic acid, and they would meet these limits, and that would be the mark. In the other case, it would be too bad, because you'd have wines that had 0.10112 of acetic acid, but so little ethyl acetate that they really didn't smell very spoiled. They'd smell a little spoiled, but they wouldn't smell very spoiled. So that would be de defeating the purpose of the law. In the case where they're produced in essentially equal quantities, then this situation, this, these limits would be quite good. Now, in the long run, of course, uh, if you produce ethyl acetate, uh, it's going to react uh, with water to produce ethyl alcohol and acetic acid. So if this first situation occurred, uh, the equilibrium is going to go this direction until you get uh, the equilibrium constant reached. 
and uh, you'll have an appropriate amount of acetic acid formed from the ethyl acetate. Uh, the same thing is true in the second case. In the second case where you get a lot of acetic acid formed, it's going to react with the ethyl acetate, with the ethyl alcohol, and the equilibrium is going to go the other direction, and you'll form the appropriate amount of ethyl acetate. So in the, in the long run, it doesn't really make any difference from the point of view of the consumer uh, whether uh, you use the, the acetic acid standard or whether you develop a new acetic acid standard, uh, ethyl acetate standard. But this equilibrium is slow, 40 years. Not many customers are going to be waiting 40 years for the equilibrium to be established. So uh, the, it probably will turn out that as soon as somebody comes up with a good ethyl acetate method, that it will probably be substituted at least partially for the acetic acid limits, or we may carry two limits for this particular one. You will be doing this, I uh, may not have a chance to comment on it next uh, uh, Certainly won't have a chance to come in the next Friday because you have a quiz coming up a week from today. But uh, when you do this uh, equilibrium here, you have to calculate. There's a problem set in your uh, in your laboratory. You have to calculate the amounts of each one of these. You cannot assume that the wine is free of water. And normal wine, let's see, you've got um, uh, let's say 12 percent alcohol and 2 percent solids. So that's 14%, it's 86% water. So you've got to fill that mole fraction in, otherwise your equilibriums won't have any meaning. Uh, but somebody will, will forget that there is water present, and um, so forth. The solution to that problem, if it doesn't come out of quadratic equation, you haven't done it right. So if you've forgotten how to do quadratic equations, you better look it up in the nearest algebra book. You have to have a quadratic equation for that, and you can figure out why. All right, ethyl laurate. Ethyl laurate is also reported to be important in European uh, uh, red wines. The uh, threshold here is about 25 milligrams per liter, uh, which isn't a great deal, but it's an appreciable amount compared to some other compounds. Alinolol and alpha terpenol, uh, these are both terpenes, are now known to be the, the important constituents of muscats. Uh, and muscats have something um, uh, sometimes as high as 124 milligrams per liter of linolol, and uh, alpha terpenol of about um, uh, 34 milligrams per liter. Uh, in uh, ordinary white wines, non muscats, the linolol content may be as low as 8, and the terpenol may hardly be detectable. So they are the two compounds that definitely tell us whether or not we have a muscat, although uh, intermediate amounts are present in Rieslings. When Van Wyck was here, he re measured these in, in uh, Rieslings, and they were running around 20, the first one, 25 maybe. I remember the exact. So Rieslings are, uh, have some relationship to muscats. And um, that um, confirms an opinion of a number of winemakers who came to California from Germany uh, in the 1930s because of Mr. Hitler. And uh, when they tasted the California Rieslings, they said they don't taste like Riesling. And so there were some wines made at wineries which are no longer functional uh, where 5% uh, of Muscat was added to the Riesling wine and everybody said, gee, how much they taste like German wines. And this may be one of the differences between the California Rieslings and the European Rieslings, that our Rieslings may be lower in, uh, in linalol. And I, somebody is going to have to run that and find out whether my supposition is correct or not. If it is, we ought to look for a Riesling clone that has higher linalol if we want it to taste like European uh, Rieslings. Now, the next compound... Uh, that would be a spoilage product if it was in wines that it shouldn't be, but it would be a good thing in wines if it should be. Hydroxymethylpurpuram is a spoilage product in some wines, but not in other wines. The amounts that we found here at Davis were from 30 to 300 milligrams per liter in some baked sherries uh, here in the campus. There are legal limits on, in Germany and Portugal, about 40 to 50 milligrams per liter is the legal limit. So you can see that a large amount of California wines exceed, uh, sherries exceed the legal limits in those countries. Uh, the reason why they have put legal limits on it 
are twofold. One, there is some indication that hydroxymethylpurpural may have some toxicity. We don't know how much, but there, there does seem to be some evidence of that. And second, uh, it indicates that the wines have been baked and uh, that uh, they have been artificially aged because baking was what you would use in Europe to artificially age wines. So the people in Portugal are not very anxious to start selling baked uh, ports. So they put the limit at 45 milligrams per liter of hydroxymethylpurpural. The other reason it functions in Germany is the feeling that wines and juices deteriorate in quality with the production of hydroxymethylpurpural. And so they have put a limit on apple juice, on grape juice, on wines, and so forth, that if hydroxymethylpurpural is formed uh, by heating, that uh, it will um, uh, be prevented from getting in the channels of trade. Uh, a recent German experiment I've given here, uh, these were several white table wines with up to 3.5% sugar, and they increased 20 milligrams per liter in 120 hours uh, um, by heating uh, to a, a 70 degrees centigrade, which isn't terribly high, 158 Fahrenheit. The uh, reported threshold is around 100, but there isn't any really good threshold. There's several reasons for this. When we were working with hydroxymethylpurpural, it's the very devil to find a pure hydroxymethylpurpural. You have to recrystallize and make a derivative and recrystallize so that um, I think people have not played around with hydroxymethylpurpural because they had a hard time getting a pure compound to work with. The next uh, compound, we don't know what it is, and, and there will be some specific and nonspecific compounds from here on in, and that's botrytis. Botrytis... Uh, does produce an odor if it grows on the surface of the grape, as it does in Sauternes and so forth, which you're familiar with from bit three. But it's also been proposed that we grow uh, the botrytis in uh, submerged culture, as we do yeast for the floor process, and then use the flavors produced in the submerged culture to add a new flavor to the wine. The odors were not identified at Western Regional Laboratory where the experiment was done. And we've had no success in defining them here, nor have the Germans defined them, nor the French have not defined them. All of them have been looking for what makes the botrytis odor. It does have some sort of an odor. Uh, the results from the Albany experiment were very unpromising. It didn't come out the same as the kind of flavor that you get when it grows on the surface of the grape. And although they tried very high amounts of oxygen, they bled in huge amounts of oxygen, and so forth. They got very good growth, and they got quite a bit of smell, but it wasn't the same kind of smell they got on the grapes. They tried, uh, as we've done under similar experiments, uh, nothing against their research ability at all. They've tried, and uh, we've tried on other compounds, to find some consumer interest in these new kinds of flavors without any success at all. Uh, so that uh, research work uh, never got any application. Now, vanillin has been isolated. It's not very easy to isolate, but the amounts are uh, very small, only 0.02 to 0.25 milligrams per liter. So there's 20 to 250 parts per billion. They're extracted from oak primarily. They're a breakdown product of lignin from oak, maybe other compounds too, but that one at least. And uh, they have a vanilla-like smell. Vanillin is not the same as the vanilla smell, but it smells like vanilla. Uh, it's particularly present in American oak, and uh, the revealing flavor of California brandies frequently is this vanillin-like smell. Uh, it's also been found in some California white wines that have been put in new oak cooperage without proper treatment of the oak. So vanillin, I would have to say, would in general be an in, at least an intrusion uh, when present in measurable amounts. It may not be a spoilage product, but at least it's a foreign product and would generally be uh, uh, considered uh, uh, undesirable. Schizosaccharomyces pombi, uh, Dr. Castor, the late Dr. Castor, when he was on the staff as our microbiologist, uh, worked considerable with this. He was interested in getting yeast that produced large amounts of flavor. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away and never was able to identify the odor that he got. And furthermore, in the experiments that have been found since that time, Schizosaccharomyces pombi turns out to have many selections. And if you get the right selection, 
you may get a desirable flavor, but if you get the wrong selection, you get an undesirable flavor. Anybody know what this has been used for now? And why we're interested in it? You're going to get it in 217 then pretty quick, but I'll give you a quick hint. Schizosaccharomyces pombe not only ferments uh, sugar, but also ferments malic acid. So in regions where there is high malic acid content, it would be very useful to use Schizosaccharomyces pombe at the start of the alcoholic fermentation to reduce the malic acid content and then let Saccharomyces cerevisia finish the fermentation and get a high alcohol yield. And the people in Würzburg and Bavaria have been working very hard on this now for five or six or seven years. And they, the, one of the first results that came out of their research was that all Schizosaccharomyces pombe is not the same. The one strain differs from another. Well, we know that there are strains of Saccharomyces cerevisia that produce hydrogen sulfide and that some that don't. We know some that produce SO2 and some that don't. So it's no surprise that you'd have uh, pombe that was desirable and undesirable. The, uh, the interesting flavor that Castor found here, we had a large number of staff tastings on it and so forth, was, uh, I think, perhaps desirable, although we never did get a chance to apply this following his death. Uh, the ones that are being tried in Bavaria at the present time uh, seem to be getting a little bit of commercial acceptance. Now, aldehydes are much more are also present in desirable and undesirable amounts. The acetaldehyde threshold in water is very low, uh, less than a milligram per liter, which is, is pretty pretty good. But again, as with ethyl acetate, when it was tried uh, in wines, the thresholds are much higher, and the difference thresholds are very high. We don't understand why this was true. We think there was something, some systematic problem in the wines that um, Filippella was using. Maybe there was SO2 in them. Maybe the glasses were washed with SO2 or something. But these thresholds are uh, higher than we would guess. We would guess the thresholds to be around 50 to 75, about three quarters of the threshold that Filippella found. It seems to be a more reasonable figure. We've simply not redone these results. Uh, but they are, they are certainly lower than that. Interesting enough that in this exper experiment, the experienced judges were much better than the inexperienced judges in getting the threshold. Uh, and that's been true of some others too. In, uh, there's a large literature now that the presence of acetaldehyde in amounts even less than the threshold, amounts of 40 and 50 milligrams per liter, are enough to reduce the quality of... Um, of sparkling wines. And there are some very good charts now available showing the relationship between acetaldehyde content and, um, and uh, quality of sparkling wines, both the uh, French champagnes, uh, Austrian champagnes, and Eastern European champagne. However, there's a little bit of danger in this result, which you've probably already put in your notes. Just because there is a good correlation between 40 milligrams per liter of acetaldehyde uh, against uh, scores, negative scores, negative correlation, doesn't mean there's any causal relationship between the two. It may be that it's not, uh, not the acetaldehyde at all that's causing the reduced quality. It may be something else that's being produced by the same process or at the same time. So although the acetaldehyde may be a good measure of spoilage in sparkling wines, it may itself not be the spoilage product that's causing the reduction in quality because the amounts present, 40 milligrams per liter, seems to be below the threshold for most people. So I've been thinking lately about various possibilities on this. Uh, it might be that the 40 milligrams added to something else is there has a synergism going on. In other words, it may be making us more sensitive to some other odor or something that's present in the champagnes that are, have the low scores may be having synergism with the acetaldehyde and giving you a smell from acetaldehyde even at below the threshold. 2 plus 2 equals 5 in some cases in odors. And this may be the situation we're having uh, here. So uh, one or the other is possible. Either it's the acetaldehyde uh, is the revealing compound and some other compound is making it smelt at these low concentrations or the acetaldehyde is simply produced simultaneously with some other very bad compound, and that's why you get the correlation. It's needed in flourishes, uh, but not needed in any other wines that I know of. 
It's not the only uh, aldehyde that's present. There are a number of other uh, aldehydes that are present in wines, and they all have uh, fairly similar uh, kinds of smell. Uh, propion aldehyde has a, uh, has a rather nice smell, uh, it seems to me. It might be a desirable one to look into. Now, the next one has to do with methyl alcohol. The amounts present are very small, 20 to 200 milligrams per liter. And in addition to that, the um, fresh, it doesn't have much odor. So we're interested in methyl alcohol from the point of view of toxicity and some other things. Uh, there's been recently some correlations made, again, I would take with a grain of salt, between uh, catechin and methanol. Uh, if you ferment wines uh, uh, on the pumice, you get higher amounts of methanol and you all get to get higher amounts of catechin. So if you knew what the normal amounts of catechin and methanol were in a wine, then if you had fermented on the pumice, they'd be higher, and you could predict that. If you had a high catechin and low methanol alcohol, it would be assumed that you uh, got, uh, were red grapes, which you'd pressed off the skins too early before the methyl alcohol had come, but where they'd been on the skins long enough to pick up the catechin content. Uh, if you had a situation where there was low catechin and high methanol, you suspect that they are uh, fortifying wines with fruit spirits which contain methanol, or that uh, you had gotten high methanol spirits from wine by some reason. <coughs> now the compound that we're most interested in of all, of all the constituents of wine, is ethyl alcohol. Uh, its uh, overall limits are somewhere between 8 or slightly lower up to uh, 22. Some vintage ports are fortified right up to 21 for this country and up to 22 for England. The thresholds reported in the literature for odor are about a half a percent. For taste, about 14 percent. And for pain, about 25 percent. Uh, that's probably why the you can't, you have to drink your scotch uh, uh, with water because you can't stand the pain of 40% uh, or 42% alcohol from um, 80 or 84 proof um, uh, scotch whiskey. But if you're an old Scotchman uh, and somebody started to put water in your scotch, you would, uh, you'd get very mad indeed because they believe that it should be drunk neat. Now, it's a moderator of tastes. It softens other tastes, particularly sugar and, al and acid. If you take a, a wine and dealkalize it and bring it back to volume and do this dealkalization under very low vacuum so that you don't get any uh, decomposition products produced during the distillation, if you do this and taste it, it will taste very unbalanced, rather acid, sour tart, an acid acid tart, the tartaric acid will show up very quickly. <coughs> so there's no doubt about the fact that alcohol does ameliorate or moderate the acid taste and probably also the tannin taste. Makes it stuff. Difference thresholds are about 1%, 1 to 2%, uh, and they go up with concentration. Low concentration at 4% alcohol. The difference threshold is about 1%. You could tell 5% from 4%. You could tell 3% from 4%. That's what the difference threshold there means. Uh, when you get up to 12%, however, the difference threshold is would have to be about 2% higher. That would be up to 12, or uh, it might be as much as 3. Up to um, uh, up to uh, 12 would be up. 2 would be up to 14. 3 would be up to uh, 15. Um, these are Davis data, and I'm honor-bound to say that they're very good data. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, that people who taste lots of wines and so forth can detect differences smaller than that, very regularly. And uh, I've been tempted many times to repeat this experiment uh, with a panel to show that that was true. Now, maybe the people I'm talking about are highly trained and represent uh, some... Uh, uh, bimodal part of the curve, which uh, Filippella didn't uh, didn't get a hold of, and that's very easy to do to be sure that you've got a normal distribution in the population that you're studying. Uh, but for whatever reason, I can show you a number of people that can surely tell you the difference between 12 and 13 percent alcohol uh, with their eyes closed and their left hand tied behind their back. 
And uh, so th this data here where it's uh, 12 and up to 14, I think, may be a little high. The sugar raises the alcohol difference thresholds. Uh, if the sugar is 5% um, uh, sugar, let's look at that column there. 5% sugar in 0% alcohol. Now, these thresholds are lower than the ones given above, which are differently determined. But it was about uh, the difference threshold from 0% alcohol up to the next place they could tell a difference was about 0.02, which is considerably lower than the 4.4 given above. I haven't figured out the reason for that. The others, the 10% alcohol, a difference threshold of 3%. That does agree with the data just above there fairly closely. And a 15% alcohol, a difference threshold in 5% sugar of 4% alcohol. There is not a big increase from there at 10 and 15 percent. That's the reason I gave you the 5 percent figures. The difference thresholds at 0 percent sugar are somewhat less, and they correspond to the ones in the chart just above. Well, the next thing is the same thing I've already said, that these uh, thresholds are too big. The higher alcohols are surely detectable. Uh, 3-methyl-1-butanol, which most of us know as isoamyl alcohol, uh, 2-methyl-1-butanol, which we know as amyl alcohol, and 2-methyl-1-propanol, which we know as isobutyl alcohol, are the three most important higher alcohols or fusel oils. Red wines have more than white wines, and uh, the question is, is high bad in this case? In Portugal and England, the answer is no. Uh, they will have in ports uh, um, amounts of 500, 600 milligrams per liter, and find them to be quite nice and quite lovely sort of things. Whereas you try and put that much fusel oil in an American dessert wine and you'll get the wine sent back by the consumer. Red uh, table wines in the Napa Valley may run as high as 300 milligrams per liter. Uh, and in a few cases, at that <coughs> level, they begin to be detectable. We have found, Professor Guyman and others here have found, that in a few cases it's high enough not only to be detectable, to, but to constitute an off odor in the wines. These are probably due to bacterial fermentations. In Napa Valley reds, usually reds made toward the end of the season will show this sort of thing. So those of you who had to make your red wines late this year might take a good look by using a GLC uh, to see if you do have high uh, isoamyl, amyl, or isobutyl alcohols. I suspect that some of them will be. It's not going to be a great year for red wines in California anyway. Uh, but it would be nice to know if these are present, because then you might be able to blend them down below the threshold and improve the wines considerably. The most important place where these constitute a, a disaster area in California is where you get a lazy still operator operating in a winery, and uh, he doesn't operate the still properly, uh, never cleans it out, for example, runs it for three or four weeks, and he gets physical carryover of the higher alcohols into the product, into the fortifying spirits. This is kind of hard to do, but lazy people can accomplish this. And you'd be surprised how many lazy uh, distillery operators there are. And once in a while a winery will fortify two or three hundred thousand gallons. And you taste it and you say, my lord, what's happening here? And then they trace it back to the fortifying spirits, and the fortifying spirits are traced back to a time when the still ran night and day, for 15 days without ever being cleaned out, and you got this physical carryover of large amounts of higher alcohols into the product, and these off smells, very distinct off smells. Acetal, this in the find in the textbooks quite frequently, uh, that acetal has a contribution to make. Uh, and this is particularly true in the Russian literature. Uh, however, just uh, Sunday, uh, Mr. Esau gave me back a paper on acetal that I'd asked him to translate and uh, by a very good Russian scientist and he says that uh, they've been running acetal by the wrong method all this time and that their results are all very much too high and that you can't, therefore you have to go back and redo all the Russian data on acetal. Now Dr. Guyman had told him that some years ago. He calculated the, the equilibrium constants for producing acetal, that's the re reaction between ethyl alcohol and acetaldehyde, and he showed that table wines and most dessert wines could have very little. In fact, uh, even under the best uh, conditions, uh, you could hardly get up more than 20 or 30 uh, milligrams per liter. 
so that, and this is at threshold limits. So we don't think now that they have very much importance in most uh, um, uh, wines, including sherries. There may be a few cases where sherries have a very high acetaldehyde content and the alcohol is right up to 20% and under those conditions you would form enough uh, acetal to be important from the sensory point of view. We have found one report in the German literature of 45 milligrams per liter in an eight-year-old German wine. I think, again, that's high. I think the method is... The method is very difficult because it's very difficult to distill acetal without also distilling acetaldehyde. You have to do the distillation at pH 9 or above. I'll tell you this very quickly. And if you do it at pH 9 or above, you produce a lot of, of uh, compounds that come over uh, right out of the wine. That's what the Russian report says, and that's what we had found out here earlier. Now, diacetyl, uh, Rankin uh, found that people were very variable in the thresholds, that some people could detect one parts per million, and he had some people that could not detect 10 milligrams per liter. Rankin's a good friend of mine, that I would have gotten some more. He only had about eight people doing the experiment. I would have gotten a lot more people, because at 10 milligrams per liter, the people, at least on this campus, uh, will run out screaming out of the room. They say it's too high. It tastes like butter or something like that. Uh, in addition, Rankin went um, further and said that at 2 to 4 milligrams per liter, it might improve the quality. All of our results show that that's probably not correct because the threshold may be as low as a half milligram per liter. One of the experiments that Tom Selfridge is doing right now uh, with this panel, which I hope you will volunteer for, uh, is running diacetyl thresholds. And from that, we expect to fortify some wines with diacetyl and see if indeed uh, diacetyl uh, has any influence and does it improve or disapprove, uh, di or does it improve or does it make worse the quality of the wine? Professor Ressler and I, uh, last year in a different kind of experiment, did not find that diacetyl had any good qualities in the way of improving the pleasantness of wine. Incidentally, there's a lot more formed uh, when iron is present. And also there's a report in the literature that if less than one milligram per liter, eight-tenths of milligram per liter is present in sparkling wines, there is a reduction in quality, and I think that's a correct result. So you can see I don't look with a great deal of favor on two to four milligrams per liter to improve quality, at least not at the moment. Ethyl acetate is not the only important ester that we have uh, in wines. Uh, ethyl acid succinate and ethyl acid tartrate are both um, uh, important and have odors. Uh, isopentyl acetate, which is present in small amounts, but the threshold for it is 0.01 milligrams per liter, or 10 parts per billion. And that's a pretty small threshold, so it doesn't take very much of it uh, to give some imprint on the sensory evaluation. 3-methylbutylethyl succinic has been reported in a young Riesli, and this has quite a potent odor. The threshold has not been determined yet. Now, on sulfur dioxide, uh, in water, 1.1 uh, milligram per liter or about 9 milligrams per liter as SO2, has been reported as a threshold. This is kind of a hard experiment to do because the effect of uh, pH is so great on the equilibrium between SO2 and water that uh, you have to control the pH very exactly, and it's very hard to control the pH in wines at exactly 7, or in water at exactly 7. Uh, the difference threshold uh, in water at 20 milligrams per liter total, total was 20 milligrams. Uh, that's, I would say, was a fairly good result. But the difference threshold in wines, when they had as much as um, uh, um, 52 parts per million of total, was 200 milligrams. In other words, you had to go up to 250 from 50 to get a difference. We think that's too much. And we've suggested that the reason for this result was that we were quite unconscious of the adaptive effect of sulfur dioxide when we did these experiments. Uh, Ms. Boggs uh, had not done her work on sulfide of potatoes down at Western Regional Laboratory at that time, and we had no idea that people would fatigue for SO2. We were giving triangle tests at this time, which are the most fatiguing kind of tests. You'll be doing them this afternoon. And um, uh, so we think these people were just uh, suffering from fatigue, and the results kept getting higher and higher, and they averaged out this way. The same thing was true for, for red. 
the difference structure of 100 milligrams per liter is pretty great. The experienced people were no better than the inexperienced. That again suggests to me that fatigue was affecting all of the people and therefore that was what they were, the results reflect. There has been some results in uh, Italy just recently that people can distinguish between 20, 50, and 100. And the experiment that Professor Ressler and I did last spring, uh, some of you may have participated in it, or maybe it's two years ago now, I can't remember. Uh, we were measuring pleasantness of 50, 150, and 250, and uh, we found that everybody could tell the difference between 50 and 150 and as to degree of pleasantness and unpleasantness. Since the amount of SO2 that we're going to be able to use is going to be less in the future than in the past, surely, uh, these threshold differences are fairly important and should be studied more. Hydrogen sulfide, there is some place in some place that I wrote that it might be as much as 30 to 50 parts per billion. That's wrong. It's somewhere around one or two parts per billion. Now there is a little simple test to determine if it is H2S or mercaptan. If you take three glasses and put into them 40 milliliters of wine, and into one glass you put water, and another glass you put copper sulfate, and the third one you put cadmium sulfate. <coughs> now copper sulfate and cadmium sulfate both react with hydrogen sulfide, whereas uh, copper sulfate does not react with mercaptans, but cadmium sulfate does react with mercaptans. So if you get a, if number one sample smells better than, or different than two and three, uh, you know that there's probably hydrogen sulfide or uh, mercaptan present. So then you have to take a look at just two and three. Now if two and three are the same, they both have taken out the hydrogen sulfide that was present, and they were already different from water, so that they are, it's probably true that there's mercaptan present then, because they're still different than, than, than water, but they're not different from each other. Since they've both taken out the sulfide, and they're still different than the water, the thing that's left must be the mercaptan. Uh, whether I said that right or not. No, I didn't say that right. And I don't think I wrote it right either, to tell you the truth now. If one is different from two and three, and two or three the same, the mercaptan is probably present. That's not true. Let me go on. If one is different from two and three, and if two and three are different, I think that's got a non sequitur in it, they call it in the English department. I think one of those should be the same, and I... Um, The second statement is correct. If one is different from two and three, and if two and three are different, both hydrogen sulfide and mercaptan are suspected because the mercaptan would be removed from, yeah, I think that's probably <coughs> still all right. If one is different from two and three, and if two and three are the same, or captain is probably present, that's right. And if yeah. one is different from two and three, and if two and three are different, both hydrogen sulfide and or captain are stuck. The same statement, if you figure it out, stands, and is, I think, correct. Now, more is produced by some yeast strains than others. And uh, there is both bound and free hydrogen sulfide, and they are both found to be important to beer quality. They may be important to white wine quality particularly German white wines, may have small amounts of bound H2S. And if they're not up to the threshold limit, they may have some contribution to make to the desirable odor. Now we come to a nonspecific compound again, earthiness. It's not moldiness. We thought that was true when we wrote the Hilgardi, or at least we mentioned that. It's very consistently found in the literature. A great many people have found it in the literature uh, all over the world. The word occurs, and that means there must be some semantic reason for it. And it's been found in the wines made from Davis grapes very regularly. And uh, we have people on the staff uh, who can very regularly pick it up. In fact, it is true that you can tell wines made from Davis grapes from Oakville grapes fairly consistently, uh, even without uh, any help from the sugar-acid ratio or anything like that. 
uh, and it's due to this earthy condition. We've tried washing the grape. It reduces them, but does not eliminate it. Now I'm going to take about two minutes to just point out some important things that you will want to read, and you can use part of this. I will take up on Monday uh, some of the taste part, which I think is important, but there's no reason to go over the material from number 20 straight down through number 43. Those are all fairly uh, straightforward. I will give you some more information on sour, the difference thresholds, bitter and sweet, as I did on odor ones that we had. And then the material starting on page three, or five, God, is that many? Five, uh, one, to the bottom of that page, uh, I'm going to have to say a word or two about that. The non-specific descriptive words, the one the reason I put this down, I put a lot of them down here. Uh, we don't like to use them if we can help it, but sometimes we can't help it. Some of these I will point out to you uh, should not be used, and I've indicated that for some of them. Like for clean, I said that's too general a term to use. Uh, and for coarse, I, maybe that's a word to use, but doesn't necessarily have a bad connotation. The use of the words complete, mature, and balanced, I don't think complete has any meaning to most people. But mature and balanced may have some meaning. The use of the word dumb, you hear wine sophisticates say, this wine is dumb, as if they had discovered something really important in the world. That doesn't have any meaning and should not be used. Elegant is the same wine. Isn't this a lovely, elegant wine? Lovely is one of those words you shouldn't use either. Um, you may love to drink wine, but the wine itself is not lovely in its own right. It's a bad English. Fat and well-fleshed, those are fancy words that should not be used. The finish, yes, I think there is a word that, or that has a meaning of some kind. Firm, meaning young with a decisive style. That sounds like they're describing um, young men or young ladies on the campus, and I don't think it should be used. It's all right for people, but not for wines. Noble, meaning with class. I have considerable doubt that that word is going to be very useful to you. The word old, however, which usually means too old, that, that's a useful word. And the, the word, I would use the word dry, but it, dry has a meaning of not meaning sugar. So uh, the dryness where it gets to be too dry, I prefer to use the French word sachet, which means to dry out, uh, which means that the wine dries your mouth out. That, I think, has uh, some meaning in red wines that are too old. To say that the finish is short uh, doesn't have much meaning to me. You should put a no there. Soft, yes, occasionally that's all right. Supple and vigorous, meaning opposite of hard and young and gusty, I don't think those have very much meaning. You can probably add your own list of bad words. The, the general philosophy is there that the word must have some general meaning for people. Okay? Specific and general also. 